cameos, guest characters, references. So often can placing a certain reference or character in a game come off as heavy-handed, an attempt to simply indulge in brand recognition or reuse old assets. It's rare and welcome when such guests are treated with respect. Just look at Solid Snake's inclusion in Super Smash Bros. Brawl compared to Sonic's to see what I mean. Both are given proper lip service in music, cool moments in story, and character design, but one of these guys was given much more emphasis on their character and their series representation, and it's pretty clear that more people fell in love with Snake through this game than newcomers looking to fall in love with Sonic. You're too slow. How do we produce more snakes? More cameos that leave a lasting impression on both the character's legacy and the game that they touch? The answer is actually very simple. Let the player in on what the character is about. Let them feel and enjoy not just the mechanics of the character, not just a lovingly crafted environment surrounding the character, but what it means to share the spotlight with them. And to illustrate this, we have perhaps the greatest cameo character of all. The man with no game. The joke that no one is in on to start with, but everyone gets on board with by the end. This is that man's history. A raging tapestry of shame and electricity that can only be given one name. This is the story of Zubat. <laughs> On October 30th, 2011, the YouTube channel Machinima released a video from content creator Two Best Friends Play, now Super Best Friends Play, called Fighterpedia Episode 1. The video was taken down before being restored earlier this year in HD because it was too true, too natural, too... Honestly, it was looking at a bunch of rejected Street Fighter 2 designs that are now in the Street Fighter Anniversary Collection's art gallery. But in that, they came across a single rejected design that did not appear to horribly misrepresent a country. Upon seeing this frighteningly manly visage, Wooly Madden, the at the time secret third best friend, uttered, now this guy is so cash. Here we've got rope whips, leather straps, spiked wrist guards, a soup catcher beard, and a ripped gym shirt with the word Zubat. Zubat. Can you feel the storm? It's coming. That day, the clouds gathered. Thunder prepared a siren call. And the storm has been looming ever since. Zubaz went on to make cameo appearances in a great majority of the remaining Fighterpedia videos released afterward, eventually bleeding into the lore of the main Best Friends channel. He featured in intros, discussions, episodes of Russellmania, and in various other creative characters. He formed a rival, the Mighty OC known only as the Rage of Africa, and lost many an original character fight-off. Zubaz was adopted as a kind of unofficial channel mascot, and given a home in whispers and occasional nods. But a home online is as hollow as the promise of Kickstarter stretch goals, and thus, a man who lived only in forgotten dreams sought to find refuge in the dreams of others. Reject it again! <laughs> On August 20th, 2013, the indie fighter Dive Kick was released. Created as an in-joke to the fighting game community, the game was designed to teach the concept of Yomi, 
or reading and correctly predicting your opponent's actions on the most basic level to a wide audience. Thusly, the game has but two options, to dive and to kick. Concepts like stick-based movement, swag, complex inputs, actual health bars, and combos were set aside for touch-of-death hard reads and limited meter management. It was, in its essence, a pure game. The Storm does not understand purity. It cannot claim to indulge in what its road warrior, bullfighter-inspired visage never learned. Entering as the Baz, Zubaz made his video game debut as one of the participants in the Dive Kick tournament. In Dive Kick Canon, he had been rejected by every single fighting competition he had ever tried to enter, desperately petitioning to be in Dive Kick as a last ditch effort to be accepted somewhere and to pay off his loans to the Mafia. And here, Zubaz screws up what it means to be a Dive Kick character. Zubaz only has one real kicky attack, and it's a special that requires meter in order to use. None of his actual kicks can cause damage, only a trail of lightning that follows him will actually harm an opponent. In the most simple fighting environment possible, and while looking like the most intimidating competitor possible, Zubaz fails to understand even the most basic of rules. In one swoop, this intimidating challenger is reduced to a bumbling hobo, who leaves Dive Kick in tears, fired by the game's very creators on the grounds of being a moron. June 26th, 2014. Shovel Knight is released. Acclaimed for its excellent level design and expansion on, rather than capitalization of, old-school platforming philosophies, Shovel Knight became an indie sensation. It's here that Baz, once again, attempted to force himself into a game, with the help of a generous thousand-dollar donation from the best friend Zaibatsu, rejected by the game's villainous group, the Order of No Quarter. Baz wandered the world, distraught on his lack of relevance, until finding Shovel Knight on the world map with all of the fanfare of a Mario 3 Hammer Brothers encounter. Thinking that slaying Shovel Knight would give him Shovel Knight's title through some contrived hardcore championship logic, Baz engages in an honestly fairly difficult boss encounter against the Spaded Soldier. Baz's moves link into each other, and his tells for re-grabbing a grapple point and slamming down on the ground are very similar. Halfway through the fight, he calls upon the to constantly rain down thunderbolts at timed intervals, shooting out in diagonals that make him very hard to approach as he constantly changes his elevation. His whip even blocks Shovel Knight's downward shovel strike, making it difficult to damage him in the first place except by charging him head on, something that Shovel Knight is not wont to do. But despite all of this, when defeated, Baz ignores a chance at chivalry and honor and cries like a baby, treated as a joke forevermore. This carries on to his other appearances in later Shovel Knight campaigns. He appears as a fanboy of the radically cool 80s relics, the Battletoads, despite a fellow bonus boss telling him he's already cool enough as he is. He's able to be recruited as an idiotic, barely literate servant for Plague Knight, and Spectre Knight basically just sees him and goes, No. Stop. Go away. This furthers the legacy of the Storm, and why his cameos mean so much. Zubaz is competent. He is a threat whenever he shows up. But no one ever treats him as anything more than an annoyance. And his resulting temper tantrums and complex about being rejected leads him to believe it. All of Zubaz's other appearances reflect this as well. He was slated to appear in Colossal Kaiju Combat, his endless regrets inspiring him to rebuild himself as a giant robot, but the game where he would show the most promise was cancelled. He's a special boss of Pocket Rumble, who hasn't been released yet as, at the time of this recording, Pocket Rumble doesn't have bosses. 
His palette is available for Beowulf and Skullgirls, a character who's also highly competent, but treated as a joke by the rest of the cast. Eventually, he'll appear as a secret boss for Indivisible, a game whose demo secret boss was an MS Paint drawing of Mike Z's cat, so... He's standing in good company. The simple fact of the matter is, for every game that Zubaz appears in, or is even referenced in, his lore expands. He remains a consistent character, wandering from game to game in search of the one place he can call home. Always being good enough to belong, but never actually doing so. There is only one other place where Zubaz has shown more brightly by falling on his face time and time again. The following contest is for the Unified DGCW Championship! Introduced first, the challenger. He is the winner of DGCW Survival and Star Road 2. The rider of the storm. Video Game Character Wrestling, or VGCW, was a Twitch-based virtual wrestling promotion using creator wrestlers based on video game characters, personalities, and Ron Burgundy that ran between November 2012 and May 2017. Despite being very silly, and having a plotline where Solid Snake recruited a time-traveling Phoenix Wright to save the future from a buff, evil version of himself named Phoenix Wrong, yes, that was a thing, matches were taken with a decent degree of seriousness, fan bases for each wrestler were formed, parallels to contemporary WWE product were drawn, and it was genuinely appreciated on its own merits, as much as it was enjoyed for novelty. On December 12th, 2014, nominations for a VGCW tournament known as Star Road 2 were opened. Here, various creator wrestlers were submitted to be placed in a 16-man King of the Ring tournament. The winner would receive a one-year minimum contract to VGCW, ensuring the creator and the character various plot lines and matches during the time. Over 170 individual characters were modeled and submitted for consideration, before the top 32, as decided by then-showrunner Baza87, were placed in a vote, with the top 16 advancing to the tournament. Zubaz was one of those 32, and the STORM callers took notice. Rallied on by the best friends faithful, Zubaz was the most highly voted for entrant, earning 12% of the total vote split 32 ways, and even overcoming the very man he piggybacked off of to get into a game, Shovel Knight. Here, a kind of resentment brew over THE incoming STORM. Zubaz hardly qualifies as a video game character, surely. Here was someone that forces outside of the VGCW community had rallied to get a spot of power. Instant heat magnet. But I mean, hey, he was one of 16 possible winners, and matches were run on AI versus AI settings, so a winner couldn't be fixed. The odds of Zubaz winning would be like lightning striking twice. And lightning did not strike twice. It struck four times in a row. On February 3rd, 2015, Zubaz overcame Mr. Torque from Borderlands 2, Revolver Ocelot from Metal Gear Solid, and Ike from the good Fire Emblem games to reach the finals of the Star Road Tournament. His wins were not beautiful, often coming after Zubaz ate a massive amount of punishment dished out by his far more physically dominating foes, but he managed a victory, by hook or crook, every time. His opponent, however, was the mighty Asura of Asura's Wrath fame. Asura had violently brutalized every opponent he came across, tossing aside King Dedede, Miles Edgeworth, and other best friend's favorite Kanji Tatsumi in dominant fashion. 
Zubaz's comparatively middling performances, and the natural VGCW crowd already being against him for daring to get so far over preferred darlings, made for a match with absolutely nuclear heat, where no matter who won, an explosion of rage was sure to follow. Set at an epic pace, Asura refused to give Zubaz breathing room, striking him with insanely powerful bursts that had felled more durable competitors in one blow. But Zubaz ate not one, but three finishers from the demigod. Stunned audiences cried out in joy and anger as Zubaz refused to back down, slowly working in a comeback, getting in hits wherever he could, trying to set up his needlessly complicated corner finisher, the dive kick. Methodically, he worked Asura into a corner, primed his boot, and became king. Finally, Zubaz had found a home. On a mixture of cheers and screams, the storm had arrived and was here to stay. In his first episode on the roster, Zubaz was mistaken for a homeless man by Kefka from Final Fantasy VI and arrested. I spent all of this build-up to let you know the kind of atmosphere built around the Zubaz character, one of massive controversy between his fans and his detractors, one where he had already proven himself to be a strong competitor when push came to shove, and one where people were dreading a reign of dominance from an outside force. So, when he lost his first five matches in a row, the dominant force that was expected of him made way for the bumbling oaf that he'd always been known as. Those loyal to the storm were begging for a victory, while those who wanted to see him fail got their wish many times over. Zubaz managed to get a fluke victory over Zangief almost four months after his debut, marking his first win in the company over an established talent. But Zangief was not held in the highest esteem at the time, and mocking names of Hubaz and SECURITY THERE'S A HOBO HERE followed him wherever he went. But still, there was assuredly hope now. He had his first victory, now he could- Zubaz lost his next nine matches in a row over the course of a year, with a record of one win, 14 losses. However, something funny happened during this time. The more Zubaz lost, the more people wanted him to win. None of Zubaz's matches were traditional squashes where he seemed completely outclassed. The Baz always had enough spirit to appear generally competitive throughout all his fights, and it seemed that victory was always just out of his reach. When a fake firing of Zubaz was teased, an audience that once had mostly hated him were saddened to see him go, and relieved when they realized it was just another joke played at his expense. By being a loser who is not a loser, Zubaz became one of the most popular commodities in a place where he was once hated. This culminated in the finale of VGCW, started by an event known as VGCW Survival. The Champion of Champions, Ganondorf, was slated to fight the Game Genie cheating device for the fate of the world. Just go with it. In order to ensure that the strongest would face the Genie, a final 36-man series of matches were determined, where the winner would fight Ganondorf in order to earn the right to fight for the fate of the world. Zubaz, after not winning a single match for over a year and a half, earned this right by overcoming 35 other men. The entire crowd's support was behind him. He had, through sheer pluck and bumbling to the right place at the right time, made himself VGCW's hero. During VGCW's final episode, Endgame 13, Zubaz and Ganon would face off. Known for squashing his opponents, Ganondorf was considered a foregone winner. But that night, the winds of change blew in. The storm was brewing. Zubaz found himself in a position eerily similar to his tangle with Asura over two years earlier, and he would not fall to Ganondorf so easily. 
history repeating itself. Zubaz endured the worst that Ganondorf had to offer, taking the Dark Lord to his absolute limit. And in the end, with one final strike, At the end of the road, Zubaz was a loser, but he was our loser, and his career ended with him as the exact same lovable loser he'd been in every game before then. I made a point at the start of this video comparing Solid Snake and Sonic's treatment in Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Now, Sonic fulfilled a lot of requests, drew a lot of eyes to the product, made people excited to see Sonic again, and ultimately ended up recycling a lot of Sonic 2006 assets and giving the blue blur a very simplified moveset. Snake, meanwhile, was carefully crafted having the codex system built into the game just for him, having his gameplay designed around tactical action, and generally having his appearance in Brawl be highly consistent with both his character and his games. Loyalty was built up through Snake that Sonic just never experienced, as it felt like the solid Snake in Brawl was the same Snake seen through the entire Metal Gear series even if he was technically a weird conglomeration of two different characters. Zubaz, to me, is the ultimate form of this, a joke told by different developers with different creative visions that everyone is in on. And once you learn the joke, you start telling it to others. A cameo appearance that catches eyes and lures in fans does well initially, but unless you capture the essence of the character, the games they appear in, what they're about. That appearance is just a flash in the pan. Zubaz appearing in games, appearing in stupid online shows, appearing in videos like this, elevates him far above what he would have been as just another Street Fighter character. Putting someone like, say, Blanca in a game just means, oh neat, we have Blanca, he's gonna do Blanca things, woo! Having Zubaz in your game gives you a character, gives you the ability to represent his mythos and add to it. And that's infinitely more exciting. A cameo should expand a character, and not only draw in pre-existing fans, but create new fans, and celebrate all that's great about the character in just a brief snippet. And in that way, the absolute loser of a character known as Zubaz is the ultimate way to design for cameo. Why so 